Welcome to Ed Talks. My name is Janae Nugent. I am a history professor at the University of Lethbridge as well as a Board of Governors teaching chair in the Teaching Center. Uh, today, I would like to begin our conversation by acknowledging that we are on traditional Blackfoot territory. At the university here, we start all of our official meetings with a uh, Blackfoot welcome, Oki Nitsu Kawawa, in recognition of uh, our um, location on Blackfoot lands. And this is a welcome to all of our friends and family. Today we have Dr. Chris Matatal here from the Faculty of Education. Welcome. Hi, thank you. You're also Assistant Dean. I am. Yes. Uh, of the Faculty of Education. S student Program Services. Yeah. Student Program Services. So yeah. Assistant Dean of Student Program Services. That's right. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us Hi, today. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know you a little bit as we've been preparing for this conversation. Mm -hmm. And you have a really fascinating uh, sort of teaching trajectory. Right. And I was wondering if you might share with us um, where you began your teaching. When I first thought of getting into teaching, I never, well, I never thought I'd be a public school teacher. You know, I thought of being in the ministry, actually, in the, as a pastoral minister and a youth pastor, actually. And um, I started down that road, but I wanted to go back to school. And I was living in Fredericton at the time, and I, and I asked uh, the board, I said, hey, look, can I go take some night classes in education? And they said, sure. Why don't you just do that first and then decide what you want to do? So I took classes for four years at uh, UNB and became a teacher. And um, I thought, wow, this is, this is going to be great. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic, you know, an exciting way to really, you know, influence young people and to have the opportunity to uh, share my love of history, which, which I do. And, uh, but I couldn't find a job. In Fredericton alone, there were like 450 supply teachers on the list. And so it was really hard to break in. So I thought, well, I, I guess I'll pamper my uh, resume a little bit. So I went out <laughs> and I took a, uh, a adult reading tutoring program so I thought wow I can teach reading now so I'll go and volunteer somewhere and so uh, I couldn't you know I was I was doing supply teaching but it, for four years and I didn't really like it I wanted to get a full-time contract but there just wasn't any there weren't any openings in the day and uh, so I said I'll tell you what I, I said to my wife I'll tell you what I'll go volunteer at the local jail to see if they need anybody to help them learn how to read so I went up to the local jail and I said to the superintendent I said D you know do you have anybody that might want to learn to read I, I'm a tutor I can I can tutor them and the superintendent's face had this kind of like really weird smirk on it. And he goes, oh, yeah, we got somebody you can teach to read. And he looked at the assistant superintendent, and they both said, Randall, at the same time. And I thought, well, that didn't sound very good, but I needed a job. So I said, OK, I'll tutor Randall. So uh, I can remember it was on a January evening, and uh, it was really dark, and it was just snowing lightly. And I went up to the local prison outside of Fredericton. And, uh, and, uh, and but this is not his name, by the way. I'm changing the names, obviously. And uh, so I met this one young man who was escorted in with a number of guards into the uh, cafeteria. And he sat down beside me. And I said, I understand you want to learn to read. And he says, yeah, I want to learn to read. Teach me to read. And 16 years old, couldn't read a word. So I sat the book down. And I, I taught this program for exactly uh, 12 words, not 12 minutes or weeks or days, 12 <laughs> words. And it started and ended with this young Randall. And as we began, I said, OK, let's get started. So I said, this is a bird with a long tail and a round body. Say bird. Complete silence. He, he was disgusted, I could tell. And he just looked at me and said, you've got to be kidding. And I said, no, no, I'm not kidding. Just, 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 just do what I say. Watch, watch. This is a bird. And he interrupted me, put his hand up shook his head. You could see he was just disgusted. Took a deep breath and he pointed up at the ceiling and he said, you see that food over there on the ceiling? And it was about 20 or 30 feet away on the top and there's food smattered all over the, the ceiling of this cafeteria. And I said, yeah, I, I see it. He goes, that's what I do when I freak out. And then he motioned to the guards and they came and they took him away. My first failure. And um, I learned pretty early that my career would be full of failures. Tons and tons and tons of failures. But you know, John Maxwell once said, when you fail or when you fall, fall forward. So I thought, that's good advice. So I went home. I was completely defeated. I was like, good grief. I mean, who am I? I can't, I can't even teach a non-reader to read. And I got a phone call. And it was the superintendent. He says, 
how would you like a full-time job? We found some money, we'd like to hire you. And I'm like, are you kidding? I said, I just failed. He goes, look, we need somebody to fail with these kids. And he says, we've got seven kids. And so I had these seven kids for two years. We called them the group of seven. And they, they said, just none of them go to school. They all hate school. Your job is to somehow get them to the place where they love to learn. And I said, all right. I said, what can I do? They said, you can do anything. Just bring them to the place where they love to learn. We're closing down this facility. It's going to be closed down. We're starting up a new facility in the Miramichi. You've got two years here. Uh, do what you have to do to do what you have to do. And so I started a journey of creating a, really, if you, if you really want to know, a love-based pedagogy. I said, I love my kids, I love my students, and I'll do what I have to do to get them to the place where they love learning. And so we experimented with everything, with art and music, and we went for walks. These are low-security kids, and so we went for walks in the, uh, the, we were allowed to go around the jail in the area, and we did outdoor adventures. We did a lot of gaming. We did a lot of play in the, in the gymnasium. We did, like I said, a lot of sculptures and artwork and paper mache just to teach them to read and to write and to love learning. And from there, I was hired to go to maximum security prison in Miramichi, and I started. Uh, I took what what I learned with me in the, all my failures and uh, and uh, you know muddling my way through those first two years. I took it to Miramichi and started working full time in that maximum security prison. So that's how I started my mm -hmm. educational journey. Never intended to work in corrections. Never intended to get outside of public school, but. When I started working with these kids, I just fell in love with them. And, uh, you know, I, the, the, I, asked, I asked one of my superintendents one day when I was then moved to the Miramichi, I said, would you let me uh, do my master's degree? And he said, sure, yeah, you can do your master's degree at night. And so I used to travel from Miramichi to Fredericton uh, all week uh, to take night classes at UNB to do my master's degree in learning disabilities. And that's how I got started. That's, that's where my journey began. I love, um, there's a number of themes there that uh, I always talk to our students about because they're, especially because I'm a history professor, what am I going to do with my degree? And yeah. well, you have to, there's a number of things, right? Like, first off, you have to be, you have to just start your journey because you never know where those connections are going to that's be. Right. You have to be willing to fail, yeah, that's right? Because <laughs> right? we, we all need to fail at some points and just be open to the opportunities and, and see them when they come yeah. at you, right? That's so. exactly right. Yeah, those are great, yeah. really interesting experiences. So, so I got really good at failing, yeah. you know, and making mistakes <laughs> and, and muddling my, my way through and trying to figure things out. And what I learned to do really early in my career was pick the brains of a lot of people who I respected, who I saw doing interesting things. And I'd say, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it that way? What could I do? Could I steal that? Can I have that, borrow that? And so big, borrow, steal became like the mantra of my early career. Right. And I thought I was, I thought I was doing really well, I, you know, uh, because... Um, like 1,300 people applied for the job that I got in the Miramichi, and I was shortlisted, and then I was asked to come and take the position. I thought, wow, I'm doing really, really well. I thought I was hot stuff, you know? And, and then um, everything was going, you know, wonderfully, and my class was going well, and we were developing a good reputation, and I was teaching in a beautiful young, uh, brand new classroom, rather, and, and the kids were responding. And then, um, and then I met Freddie. I, you know, I became complacent. I, I became, you know, uh, you know, I became stuck on my, you know, my laurels, so to speak, and uh, I wasn't pressing on and being challenged. But then came along this kid, 16-year-old kid, who, for the first time in my life, first time in my life, I hated a student, and I hate admitting that, especially on camera, where you have to say, "Well, I, I came to a place in my teaching career where I hated somebody." But this guy, he was a very bitter, angry young man. Um, and he'd come into my classroom every day. He'd be swearing just enough to get in trouble, but not enough to get kicked out of class, just enough to annoy everybody, but not enough to be you know, put in solitary confinement. He, did, he pushed everybody's buttons, and everybody disliked this kid. And I got to the place after about three or four months where he was ruining every class that I had. Kids hated him. We were on the verge of a fight all the time. I had a full-time security officer in my classroom every day. 
I was well aware of my exits, and we always wore a radio on us, and we always, uh, I had three exits to my classroom just in case something happened. Uh, it was, it was like a maximum, it was a maximum security prison, so everything was secure in a special way. It was all specially designed, and I felt secure in the building, but I felt really insecure in that classroom space because I didn't know what this kid was going to do. He's one of these wiry kids that could explode at any minute. And I got to the place where I sought ways to get him out of my class. Like, he was always there. Like, they're always captive audience, my students, so to speak. And, uh, but he had perfect attendance. He showed up every single class, never missed a day. And I was like, what is it with this kid? Why doesn't he get locked up on the weekend? Why doesn't somebody take a punch at him? Why don't he? And I, and I kept thinking, maybe I should hire one of the kids to do something, you know? <laughs> I contemplated everything. And it got so serious that I actually started looking for work elsewhere and contemplating leaving. One day I was so upset. I had a Friday afternoon off, so I knew I didn't have to go to the, they were doing uh, training or some sort with the, with the security officers, so I didn't have to go to class that day. Classes were canceled. And I was sitting in the cafeteria with some of my colleagues, and they were all packing up their stuff, and they were leaving and going out to the afternoon to do some work or whatever. And one of my friends, who happened to be one of the school psychologists, was sitting across from me, and I waited until everybody left, and I said, Nick, can I talk to you for a minute? And she said, yeah, sure. And I said, I've, I've got a real problem. I hate this kid named Freddie. Again, it's not his name. So we sat and talked for about a half an hour, and finally she said, you know, Chris, I think, I think you need to go read Freddie's file. Just go lock your way. You got the afternoon off. Why don't you go read his file? And I said, well, I don't really want to go read his file. I know what he's in here for. He's a little jerk. You know, I can't stand this little kid. And I was complaining. And I said, uh, I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I don't want to read this kid's file. And she implored me. She said, you've, you've got to go read his file. Trust me. Read his file. Lock yourself in the, the records room. Sit down with the file and read his file. And she made me promise. We got into an argument. And I said, I'm not going to read his files. She goes, read his files. I'm not going to get rid of it. And we went back and forth. And finally, I said, OK, 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 leave me alone. Friday afternoon, I promise I'll go read his file. She made me promise. I said, I'll go read his file. I put away my dishes, went to the records room, locked myself in the records room. And this records room is like, like a library with shelf after shelf of all the inmates' records and everything, of all their, all their uh, uh, offenses and all their charges and all their psych reports and everything are on these big D-ring binders. And I found Freddie's file, and there it was. It took up a large section shelf, four five-inch D-ring binders full of incident reports and uh, arrest charges and all this type of stuff. And I'm like, whoa. OK, to appease that lady, I'll just pull out one of them, sit on the table, and just start reading. And I don't know if it's providential or if it's by luck, but I grabbed one of the files, and I put it on the table, and I turned it open, and it fell open to Freddie's psychiatric file. And there it detailed a whole life of a young boy who had severe ADHD. He had the combined type, so he was hyperactive and he was inattentive. And it started early in his schooling years, and uh, his teachers didn't know how to deal with him. Nobody knew how to deal with him. Even his own parents didn't know how to deal with him. And that caused a lot of tension and fights in his home to the place where finally his mom said, I'm out of here. I can't deal with this kid anymore. I, never, I, I, didn't, buy, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't want to have a kid like this. I, I'm out of here. And she left. And a crack developed on Freddie's foundation because his mom left. And his father blamed him and said, look what you've done. You know, it's you. You're just, you're wrecking everything. I, I, I work hard every day and my boss is telling me that if I have to keep going to the school to get you out of trouble every day and bringing you home, I'm going to lose my job. And that's exactly what started to happen. Freddie, again, would never get kicked out of school or, or, or kicked out permanently. He'd always get kicked out uh, for a few days here and there, and his father had to come and get him, and come and get him, and come and get him. And finally, his father broke, and his father said, I've had enough. And one day after Freddie was in grade five or so, I think it was, Freddie was, uh, his principal called his father and said, you've got to come get him. And he said, I can't come get him. If I do, my boss will fire me. And he says, you either come get him, or, or we, we just can't have him in the school anymore. And so his father was just furious. And as he walked out the door, his boss says, I'm sorry. You're done. And uh, his father went and picked him up at school and drove him home and yelled at him the whole time. And he finally got him home. He screamed at him and screamed at him. And during the whole time, his father was busy putting on a, a large pot of water on the stove. And he yelled at him and yelled at him continuously until the pot boiled over. And his father grabbed that pot and dumped it into Freddie's uh, stomach and genital areas on his legs, burning him and severely burning him. Freddie went to hospital, his father went to prison.
and another crack developed in his uh, foundation. And so Freddie went off to foster homes, and uh, I don't know if you know much about foster homes, but they can be great or they can be, they can be not so great. And Freddie's were not so great. And he continued to get in trouble in school and he contribute, continued to go to uh, hospital visits to, for all the skin grafts and everything that had to happen. And as it turned out, he had to wear gauze bandages and nylons. And, and when you're in grade six, that's not the type of uniform you want to be wearing in grade six gym class. And his, you know, he wasn't liked anyway because of his prickly personality and, he, and his ADHD. It, it, he had social skills problems. And all of these kids saw him wearing these gauze bandages and these nylons and they attacked him. And they called him gay, and they called him all sorts of derogatory terms. And so another crack developed in his foundation, because now all of his friends turned on him. So he didn't like women because of what his mom did. He didn't like men because of what his dad did. He didn't like homosexuals. He didn't like uh, his, any peers. I mean, it didn't leave many people for him to like. And Freddie was completely broken, and he went into a life of crime. And I'll never forget my reaction that Friday afternoon as I read his complete file. I, I had a complete and utter paradigm shift in my life where my entire perspective of this kid went from hating this kid to instantly loving this child. And um, I'm not going to do it today because I'm under control, but uh, I, when I usually tell that story, I, I, it's overwhelming the emotion because I remember I couldn't speak for nearly two days. And I went home and my wife knew something was wrong, but I would... I would just go off by myself and I would cry and cry and cry for that boy. And I was completely broken for him and I was completely changed, utterly changed for Freddie. So that by Monday morning when I went in, Freddie came into class and he was identical Freddie that I saw a lot the Friday before, but I had changed. And I had changed so profoundly that I had unconditional love for that kid and I had unconditional patience and uh, I had changed so dramatically that Freddie noticed. In fact, on the last day of class, which is several months later, I had seen a great shift in this kid because I started loving him. And I had tremendous patience with him. And uh, he started to work for me. He never worked for anybody else, but he worked for me. He'd write for me, he'd read for me, he'd do math for me, do social studies for me. And at the last day of class, he asked the security officer if he could just talk to me privately for a few minutes. And, as the security officer left the room, Freddie looked at me and said, um, he said, you read my file, didn't you? And I said, I did, Freddie. And he says, I know, I could tell. He said, nobody's ever loved me like you loved me before. No other teacher's ever cared for me the way you've cared for me before. He said, I just wanted to know how much, I, how much it means to me that you care for me the way you do. I've never seen Freddie again, never saw him again. He was released that summer and I don't think he ever came back. I never saw him again for the years I was there. And I don't, I don't know where that kid is today, but um, I just saw it almost as my calling to have a, try to have an influence on every one of the kids that came into my care from that time forward and for the remaining four years that I had at that, uh, at that prison. Right. So that was the start of the building of who I am as far as loving my students. Right, and it's um, really shaped where your PhD studies went and, um, and where you've gone to as a scholar as well. That's right. It's changed everything about me because I, I really do see, and I teach this now in my ed psych classes and my uh, introduction to educational psychology for exceptional learners class, that probably the foundation for every teacher is to get to the place where you learn about your students. Learn what you can about your students. Love your students for who they are. You, you cannot change their home environment. You can't change a lot of things about them. Kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, that saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to start with this ethic of loving students and loving your students because you can control that. And it starts by getting to know your kids. Right. And that's where it started with me. And uh, so from that point on, everything I tried to do uh, was to try to figure out ways to reach kids in new and creative ways. And that was either through art or through play or for, through drama or music. And so I used a lot of different areas to try to reach my students. Right. And you've really tied that into sort of how the brain functions and learning about um, sort of learning challenges as well as uh, social dynamics, I think, as That's well, right. right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, we know that human beings learn best when they develop relationships. And I think, and Vygotsky used to talk about how 
uh, learning is created, learning is maintained through social relationships. I mean, when you take a young baby, if you could somehow feed that baby, of course this would be completely immoral, but if you could find a way to feed that baby but not provide any, any relationships or social stroking at all, that baby would be profoundly intellectually disabled because they would lack love and language and touch and interaction that human brains need in order to develop and to grow. So, I mean, there's uh, one of our uh, master's students this year won uh, best thesis in Canada. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, I don't know if I'm allowed to drop names or whatever, but he did a brilliant job of looking at the high school redesign in Alberta. And one of the things that the high school redesign has looked at is the role of teacher to student relationships and the value that relationships have on all students, whether they seem to be well adjusted or not. And relationships make a difference to how the brain develops. Warm relationships that have a lot of engagement and language and back and forth communication build healthier and stronger brains than ones that have neglect or very little social contact or language. We know that. We know that from neuroscience. We know it from cognitive psychology. So when teachers actually involve themselves in their students' lives, like, what did you do this weekend? Uh, how was the concert this weekend? How was your hockey tournament this weekend? And students feel a real connection to their teachers, they do buy in more to what the teacher is trying to teach them. Because there's this ethic of care that goes back and forth between the teacher and the student that actually changes the way that the student engages and tries to attend to what the teacher teaches. And the same thing has to be true in our university classes. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is um, an important theme that you would bring to the classroom. Oh, yeah. absolutely. In fact, like uh, we were just talking to a colleague of mine over lunch, and uh, we're talking about some of the things that you know, some of the things that we do in our classrooms here at the university that I think is important. And um, one of the things I value about our classes here at, at the University of Lethbridge is that we have small classes, for the most part. You know, like in in Ed Psych and. And in, in the faculty of education, we try to keep our classes below a certain number. I know it's not always possible, and that's fine, but uh, we try to have our classes below 40, at, you know, maximum 40 if we can. And they're usually in the 30s or around 30. And uh, one of the things that I try to do in my classroom is I try to provide food every class. Now, I know a lot of people can't do that, but healthy snacks, even apples, and it, it, it's funny, you know, it has this like flywheel effect. It gets started slow, I'll bring a bunch of apples, I'll cut them up. And I'll put some yogurt out in little cups and, and, uh, and uh, spoons for the students. And I say, look, I, I, I want you to eat healthy. You know, you're here for a lengthy period of time. Grab yourself something to eat. Feel free to bring some food, too, if you'd like. And you can eat here or you can bring some to share if you, if you like to cook or whatever. And it is amazing, by the end of our time together, like the end of this, the term, how much food is actually brought in every <laughs> class. Because everybody buys in and they say it's, it's important to have a healthy uh, uh, breakfast in the morning, if it's a morning class or an afternoon. And we had a chef in our classroom, so we made up this, he made, I don't even know the name of what he made up, but everybody else did, and, they, and it was great food. We had like a buffet going on by the end of our time <laughs> together. But it was like, the feeling in our classroom was, and, and I get this on my course evaluations too, that a group that eats together seems to be really close together. Mm -hmm. And so we, we would, I would sacrifice some instructional time in order for them to get their food and and get together and have a few minutes to talk during class just to catch up. And our relationships in class are very, very strong, I think. And I think that's healthy. Right, yeah. Well, eating is a prime social interaction, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah. I like that. So how did you go from being in New Brunswick to out here in Lethbridge? I'm not sure. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, actually, I was um, when I was at, at the prison, and I worked there for six years altogether, I um, applied for and accepted a position or a, a promotion, if you will, to being a student services supervisor in southeastern New Brunswick. So I was actually uh, responsible for 33 elementary schools and all of their special education teachers and um, all of the educational assistants. So I did that for four years. And while I was there, again, because I'm used to making so many mistakes, I really felt incompetent in many ways when you're working with, like when I was working in the prison setting, that's where I really learned to listen to students. When I started working at the district level, that's where I really started to listen to teachers and listen to principals and listen to parents. And I felt, I felt like, wow, I feel kind of incompetent. And I said to my wife one day, I, I would like to go back and do my PhD. 
of course, I had to convince my wife first, of course, before anybody else. And she said, uh, that, would, that would be interesting. We should, we should look into that. And at that very same time, I got involved in a study that a, um, a researcher was doing with our district. And I became one of the collaborators with a research study that uh, a group of researchers, audiologists and speech language pathologists were doing in our school district. And they wanted to study the effect of sound field systems, you know, where teachers wear the microphones and, mm -hmm. and children can hear sound properly in grades one, two, and three. They wanted to see what kind of impact would better hearing have on early reading skills. Because their theory was that there's a lot of uh, ear infections on young children, a lot of colds, and they miss a lot of the, the sounds, sometimes for weeks and they don't properly hear the sounds and the phonics and, uh, and they don't gain a, a proper uh, phonemic awareness uh, because of uh, colds and you know, uh, ear infections and such. So they put sound field systems in, uh, we put them in 30 classrooms and uh, we, we got some money for that and we purchased them and put them in and they did reading scores throughout the year and compared to classrooms that did not have sound field systems in it and they found that there was a significant difference in the reading levels of children who could actually hear what the teacher was saying compared to those who went through long periods of time of not being able to hear what the teacher said. Wow. And that study was w widely published and uh, cited and it was exciting watching how these researchers worked and I said to my wife, I said, you know, I can s I, that's what I've been wanting to do. Except I want to work in the area of special education and cognition. How the brain works, how the brain of special learners works, diverse learners. and so. I applied for and was accepted at Queen's University and I was sponsored by uh, an amazing uh, researcher there by the, by the name of Leslie Wade Woolley and um, she brought me into her learning lab which is a reading research lab and I spent four years at Queen's and did my PhD there. So once that happened, I, um, I can remember my boss at the, at the district level said, you'll never be back at the district level, you'll probably go on to universities and she was right. And after I graduated, I accepted a position at Memorial University, and I was there for four years in the ed psych and special education. So that's how my journey got to there. And then, um, and I was in Newfoundland, and Newfoundland's a wonderful place. It's a fascinating place, but uh, while I was there, I, was, I, I had this glorious opportunity to go to the Middle East to do some professional development in uh, Muscat, Oman. It was 50 degrees there. I loved it. And uh, I can remember I went into this school, and it was a... It was a um, Omani school that used Alberta curriculum and it was supposed to be an English school but um, the owner of the school, the CEO of the school kind of kind of fudged the the abilities of the students a little bit and the teachers there said our students don't speak English at all we could we could use some help like how do we differentiate differentiate so that we can meet the needs of these students and they called on uh, just happened to call on Memorial University and, and I was invited to go and do this workshop with all these teachers. And when I got there, I said, I, I remember walking to Muscat Oman and I said, where did you get that Tim Hortons coffee? And they said, yeah, there's a Tim Hortons down the road. I said, you gotta be kidding. And I said, there's a Tim Hortons here. They said, yeah, there's an ice hockey team here too. And I said, you gotta be kidding. And they said, yeah, we all play for it. And I said, who are you people? And they said, we all came from the University of Lethbridge. And I go, like, what? And they said, yeah, it's the best uh, education university in Canada. And I said, oh, you're being cocky. <laughs> I said, there's no way. I said, yeah. And they had nine of them, nine teachers at this school were from the University of Lethbridge. And um, what the girls uh, basketball coach here at the University of Lethbridge, Dave Adams, was the first principal at that school. Mm -hmm. And he brought a lot of the kinesiology uh, uh, teachers with him to go over to help teach that, uh, that opening up that school. And he did a fantastic job starting up this school and bringing these, these young people to be their first teachers at this uh, al Ruad International School in Muscat, Oman, <laughs> where all these Alberta teachers there from the University of Lethbridge. And they were amazing. Like, I mean, not only did they have a gigantic task ahead of them to try to teach these uh, young uh, Muslim, non-English speaking teachers to learn their culture, to, to be thrown into that very difficult situation, but they're but they were fantastic in what they did. They were fully prepared. They, their attitudes were like, we'll figure this out. We'll get this, you know? And uh, I was really impressed. I was so impressed. Um, and simultaneously, there was a friend of mine who was going to L, and she had this Facebook posting, and she had all this stuff posted all over the place going, look at what we're doing at the L. look at what we're doing at the L." And, and I was like, hmm, 
we're not doing that in my my classes. It, there wasn't there wasn't that pride. It didn't seem like there was such pride where I was before. And that's not to put Memorial down or anything like that. Memorial's a fantastic school, but I was like, what is going on at the Uni University of Lethbridge? And right at that time, an ad came out looking for an ed psych person <laughs> in special education at the University of Lethbridge, and and I said. I'm going to find out. And so I did my research, and I was so impressed by what I read about the University of Lethbridge. And the fact that they had a neuroscience department here, you know, the, the uh, Center for Behavioral Neurosciences, and I was like, whoa. And I found out that they work very closely together. And I said, this is like a dream come true. So I applied, and lo and behold, I got the job. And uh, the most welcoming faculty, uh, the dean is the, the best in the world. I'll stand by that until the day I die. And uh, uh, I was just super impressed with these people, and when I got the job, I was just thrilled to come here. So that's how I got here. Right. All well, because of a group of teachers in the Middle East. <laughs> who would have thunk? Yeah, who would have thought? <laughs> no, I just couldn't believe it. So um, I was just, I was just impressed by those teachers. No, oh, and I'm sure they were impressed by you when you applied as well. Uh, it's something that I think that we didn't talk about was that you have also won a national awards mm. for your Blacklight Theater Company. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, when I was in prison, and I do take delight in saying that I spent <laughs> six years in a maximum security prison <laughs> as a teacher, but uh, one of the things that uh, I saw on TV one day was uh, famous people players. I think most people know that they use, they use uh, students with intellectual disabilities like Down syndrome and all different forms of intellectual disability to run a black light theater company. And I thought, that's brilliant. And so I called the director of that uh, theater company and I said, hey, could I come over and learn how to do this? And um, she wasn't able to accommodate me at that time, and so I went to a blacklight theater company in Nova Scotia. And I said, can I come down and pick your brain? They said, come on down, take all the pictures you want, we'll give you all the tips you want. And for like three days, they said, hey, you could do this, you could do this. And they, they showed me how to do all the lighting and do all the paint and all that type of stuff. And they said, you could do it, you could do it, you could do it with these young offenders. And so uh, my superintendent was fantastic, and he says, yeah, you know what? We'll try to find you some money. We'll try to buy you some stuff. I contacted the University of New Brunswick Theater Company and I said, do you guys got any props you want to throw away? And they said, we got a whole bunch of stuff we'll give you. And so they gave me a whole set of these like stand up black, uh, flat black uh, risers. And they said, here, take this. They were giving me tons of stuff. And we, honestly, we started our theater with a whole bunch of equipment from UNB and from uh, the New Brunswick government gave us some money to buy paint. It was $250 a gallon because it fluoresced under black light. Oh. And so we, we took all this styrofoam and we made these props and we painted them in fluorescent paint and uh, they would just pop under black light. So one day I brought all my young offenders into this room and I said, I'm going to turn the lights off and I'm going to show you something. And I turned on the black lights and your teeth actually glow under black light. It's funny. Like, and they had white shirts on and it was like they'd never seen anything like this before. They were like, whoa, look at my shirt, look at my teeth. And they laughed and I said, watch this. And I brought this prop out that I had previously painted. It was like a puppet. And I brought it out and they were instantly sold on it. They said, this is the coolest thing ever. And I said, yep. And you're going to tell a story. And I said, we're going to do a theater group and we're going to tour with this theater group and we're going to bring people into the prison and you're going to do shows. And so I took a group of uh, really trustworthy, low security and middle security youth and they said, we're, we're hooked. And for a few months, I asked them, I want, I want you to determine what we're going to tell people as a, as a show. And they said, sir, because I called everybody sir there, they said, sir, what we'd really like to do is we'd like to prevent people from coming in here. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to talk to teenagers about the dangers of drug use and the dangers of sex before marriage and the da all this type of, it was these ideas that they came up with and about this and about this and they had about six themes and I said alright you're gonna do it not me and all of my students now understand all of my students in my class had a learning disability or an emotional behavior disorder so they either had ADHD depression anxiety uh, some had schizophrenia some had uh, bipolar disorder we, everything under the sun all these kids had and I said to them so what that's who you are that's who we are so we don't let our our problems define us we let what we do define us and so we're going to do this blacklight theater and we're going to show people that we can do great things. And so I, um, I put up, you know, I used to go to the, the newspaper and get those roll ends and I'd roll out this paper that'd be 30 or 40 feet long and I'd say, okay, let's start designing the script. What do you want to say? And they'd start writing stuff down and we'd start brainstorming and we started developing a script. And you know, when, 
when you get excited about something, people tend to follow an excited person. And I was excited about it, and I got a couple of my colleagues excited about it, which got the superintendent excited about it, and he started talking about people in the department about it, and they got excited about it. And um, a local uh, radio company got excited about it, and the guy said, if you bring in all the music you choose and your script, and you record their voices, like because they, they were going to do script and stuff, and you record it beforehand, I will do a professional soundtrack for you so that they don't have to remember lines. They'll have a soundtrack already pre-recorded, and all they have to do is learn to move the props and everything else and the puppets to the soundtrack. And that's a great mnemonic device, right? Yeah. You know, they can, they can practice with the soundtrack and they can uh, do all their moves. So this guy volunteered all of his time. Well, I had to pay him Tim Horton's coffee. I bring him in a coffee to the studio and he mixed a soundtrack for us that was professionally mixed. And we put the soundtrack on and the kids they, they made all the props and all the puppets, and we made this beautiful soundtrack called Out of the Dark. And it was all about these kids coming out of the dark. It was like they woke up out of the dark. It's actually based on a, a true story out of the uh, prairies. Oh. I remember one day I told them the story. It's actually based on a farmer, and I, I don't know the details of the farmer's name, but uh, there was a wildfire here in the prairies one year, and it swept across the prairie and it took this guy's house and barn and everything. And when he came back onto his property to survey the damage, uh, he was overwhelmed with grief and he went walking through the fields one day, black. You know, you see, you can picture just complete black fields. Barns are gone, the cars are gone, all, everything, all the, everything's gone. And as he's walking through the field, he's actually walking and there's a cloud of black soot being kicked up as he's walking and his face is covered in soot and he's weeping and the tears are just making streams down his face and dropping off the end of his jaw. And he was so frustrated and angry at God and angry at everybody else and he came across a, just this black pile of dirt and he got so angry he kicked it, except it wasn't a black pile of dirt. It was a chicken that had run from his barns with all of its chicks to escape the fire. And she, sacrificially, had gathered her chicks to her and laid her body on the chicks and sacrificed herself and burned to death. And she was a charred black remain. But when he kicked it away, out from underneath that blackness came these five or six bright, bright yellow chicks who were saved because of this sacrificial uh, giving of her life of the, of the mother for her chicks and these little peeping chips came, ch uh, chicks came out and they were bright, bright, bright yellow against this blackness. It's like they came out of the dark. Mm -hmm. And when I told the kids that story, one of the kids said to me, that's us, where are those chicks? Now you, you can imagine the effect that that had on those kids when they realized that that was them. And I said, this theater is about you coming out of the dark. And that was actually our logo for a while, was this little bright yellow chick on this mm -hmm. black background. So they put together this script. I gotta tell you this story too. And we start to perform it, and uh, out of the dark. And again, it was all about drug use, and it was all about, um, uh, really, a, about way men treat girls and all this type of stuff. This is what they wrote. And we were invited to go to, and I, I won't mention the school, but we were invited to go to this middle school that was having a significant amount of problems, middle school now, grades six, seven, eight, with prostitution and drug use in New Brunswick. And we set up, we came into this gymnasium, and we set up, we set up our stuff, and we get all set up, and the lights are all in place, and we were just ready to receive all the students. They had 600 students that were coming to see this show. And we're in the dressing room getting ready, and, and all, the, all of us dressed in black. And I wore a headset because I would be in one position. I'd be talking to some of my, they all had microphones and, and headsets on. But they were all covered in black, black hoods and stuff. So you couldn't see them. They were just moving all the props around, telling the story. And we're in the dressing room getting ready, and the principal came in. And he goes, can I speak to you guys before you start? We said, sure. He says, let me tell you why I invited you here. And he told us all about a young girl who was prostituting herself to afford drugs. And he was talking about all the drugs that were flowing in their school. And he says, it's ruining my school. He says, I'm desperate. I heard about your message, and I want you to speak to my young people about what, what this is doing. And they'll listen to you because you're young offenders. And he walked out. And one of the kids looked and said, boys, let's make this the best performance we've ever done. And so we went out, 600 kids. We performed standing ovation. You can imagine what that does to a young offender who's had no success in his life to get standing ovation after standing ovation. 
And after we were done, and we were starting to tear down the set, and all the students had been excused, we looked down the hall and we could see the lineup into the guidance counselor's office room, went all the way down the hall with kids seeking help for the problems that they were having. And our kids saw that, and it had a profound impact on those kids, on look at what we've done through our message. And of course, that got to the Learning Disability Association of Canada, and, and uh, we won a, a national award for the work that we did for kids with LD and uh, kids across the province. So, right. Yeah, wow. and so it was pretty cool. And we did a number of performances. We did a Christmas show one year uh, all about disability. And it's all about a, a young teddy bear who was missing a button off of his, uh, off of his corduroys. The corduroy bear was the story, and we adapted it. And we brought in all these grade one and two children into the prison, into our chapel area. And we did, the, we did a Christmas presentation for all these kids, and they just they loved it. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. And our students loved it, too. You can imagine, as they started serving and serving and serving more, it meant a lot to them. And I'll tell you how much it means to them. I just got a, an email the other day from a, a guy that was in this production. And uh, he spent 12 years in a maximum security prison for cocaine uh, um, trafficking and he's out now and he has his own business and I, I can't say much about that but he has his own business and he's doing well and he got married and he's looking to have children and he's doing really really well and he contacted me the other day and he said I just want you to know that those days those early days even though I continued to make some mistakes and I had a hard time getting off drugs and I made all these mistakes I just want you to know that they hung with me all those days because it, it showed me how much people cared because they were willing to do different things to meet us where we were. And uh, he says it, it changed his life. Even though he was addicted and he, he went into some patterns that he couldn't break, he still hangs on to those all those years later. So, so I think that's why we, were, we, we won that award. I accepted on behalf of the, you know, all of us, but uh, um, it was just one of those, those neat things that you look back on and say, I was glad I did it. For all the work and all the effort, it was worth it. Uh, and I mean, those are such powerful and amazing oh. stories, and they have clearly shaped who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, and you must bring that then into your classrooms and um, the messages of diversity, right, yeah. and inclusion. Yeah. And you're constantly needing to be flexible, which you know your experiences have definitely taught you. Oh. <laughs> and uh, you're telling me uh, earlier about an experience with a student who um, is sight impaired and how you've dealt with uh, those challenges yeah. that she has in the classroom. Yeah. Oh, I'm currently working with a student who's visually impaired and she's a brilliant young woman who ran into a situation where the school was not prepared for a visually impaired teacher. They didn't know what to do. And so they, they said, okay, well, can we put on the brakes here and, and uh, and figure some things out. And uh, usually if, if a school says, uh, we'd like to put on the brakes, then the student's required to withdraw and they have to go through like a remediation program to get them back into a school. They usually withdraw for various reasons, right? We said, no, this is a unique case. This is a young woman who, quite frankly, is a round peg in a square hole as far as the school system is concerned. That nobody's ever dealt with a visually impaired teacher before and they didn't know how to, to accommodate her on their practicum. So I said, tell you what, instead of withdrawing you, why don't we do an independent course together and really knock it out of the park so you can show a potential employer that you can teach so effectively that you don't have to depend on your site. And so she entered into an independent study with me, which we're just concluding now, and she's doing marvelously. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but there are over 50,000 blind teachers in the United States. There's an organization called Blind Teachers of America. Uh, so it's not uncommon to have a teacher who can't see. And it actually reminds me of a situation where I try to challenge my students all the time. I said, I know of two situations existing at the moment of university professors in the United States. One's in Pennsylvania. And there was a woman who taught English in the English department who lost her voice because of cancer. Complete loss of voice. But um, she convinced her dean to allow her to teach the next semester. And I said to my students, now how on earth are you going to teach an English class and not being able to speak a word? The course evaluations for that woman at the end of her first term were the highest in the department. 
Students said it was their favorite course. So I say to my students all the time, how would you teach if tomorrow you lost your voice? Or do you rely too much on talking in your teaching? Because teaching is not talking. What would you do differently? And so it, it gets our students to think outside the box. Similar to if you can't see, how would you teach? If you can't speak, how would you teach? If you can't hear, how would you teach? If you can't read, how would you teach? If you have a learning disability, a lot of my students do. If you have an anxiety disorder, how would you teach? And so all of our students are challenged on a regular basis to think differently about what teaching is, what learning is, how human beings learn, and how you can interact with those little human beings to get them to the place where they're actually learning. And so that's a lot of what we try to do and try to change the thinking about how to teach. Oh, that's great. Um, you moved into the dean's office recently. Mm. And how are you liking that? <laughs> it's different. And uh, I don't mean a bad difference. It's, uh, it's a good difference. I, as the uh, assistant dean of student program services, our, our departments, um, we're in charge of all the admission into our faculty. We're in charge of awards, which is fun. We're in charge of graduation, all the grad checks, which is also rewarding, and we get to be with these, uh, with these students. But we're also in charge of um, when things don't go well for students, that's part of my job too. And so uh, we bring in students who sometimes have to withdraw for uh, many reasons. And my job is to really add a human element, a relational element to our department with these students who first fail. Because, I mean, when I look in the mirror, I see a guy who has failed so many times that if I judge myself harshly, I probably wouldn't be a, a professor. I probably wouldn't, you know, I, I, would, I would just uh, treat myself harshly. But so when I look at these students, I say, okay, what is it that these students need? Even if they messed up, even if they've done something wrong, how do we deal with them in such a way that we maintain their dig dignity and we deal with them in ways that uh, our integrity allows them to be professional educators and yet maintains uh, you know, our standards. And so we deal a lot behind closed doors with students to try to get them either to see that teaching's not for them, if that's the case, or to help them to remediate difficulties that they have. So I'll give you an example. Just recently we had a student come in. He was out on professional semester, he's out on his practicum, and he's doing very poorly. He, he hated it. He wasn't sleeping at night, he was sick. We brought him in. The school noticed that he wasn't doing very well. The school says, look, we can't have this guy in our school. We would like to end the practicum. So he comes in. He's sitting there. He's all nervous. And we close the door and we say, look, let's just close the door for a minute and let's have an honest discussion between you and me. No judgment. Let's just put it all out there on the table. How do you feel about teaching? And he says, I hate it. He says, I don't want to be a teacher. I want to be, and I better not mention his, what he wanted to be just in case it identifies him. But we'll just say, I don't know, I want to be a, a lawyer or something like that. That wasn't it. But, and I said, well, then why don't you go and be a lawyer? And he said, am I allowed to do that? <laughs> and I said, I said I, you can do whatever you want. And he says, I thought I had to be a teacher. I don't know why. He says, but I thought I had to be a teacher. My parents have always known I wanted to be a lawyer. And somehow I got into this and I thought I had to continue to be a teacher, but I want to be a lawyer. And I said, you should be a lawyer. And we, uh, other conversations we had with him, he left with a smile on his face and said, I'm not going to be a teacher. And I'm <laughs> thrilled about it. And we released him from that fear of failing his teaching. And he went on and he's going on his career. Right. Now, when, 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 when kids, or I say kids, sorry, when students want to be um, teachers and we say, if this is really what you want to be, then we'll try to remediate the problems that we saw in your first practicum or whatever. And we build a plan with them and we see it through. And even though that sometimes their progress is delayed by a year, maybe even two, we work with them and uh, we remediate uh, their areas of need and then they go back in to do another practicum. A lot of people don't know this, but our success rate right now is that 96% of our students who come into education stay and see it through to graduation. Oh, well, that's and huge. even the four that withdraw, Half of those we remediate and work back into teaching. So our success rate is very, very high. And that's because we, have a, we, we truly, truly believe that once you're our student, you're our student. We're not going to give up on you until you decide, you know what, I don't want to be a teacher. Right. So it takes a lot of work, but that's my office. So we've seen a lot of success in that way. And uh, so in, the, in, in administration, that's been one of the highlights 
But I still get to teach, which is nice. I still get to do research, which is nice, mm -hmm. and write, which is nice. I just don't do as much as I would like sometimes, but yeah. it's rewarding being there. Well, and your office has some really interesting initiatives that you've been uh, working on as well. Do you want to maybe tell us about some of those? Yeah. Well, I, you know what? I, I decided to you know, poke around to kind of find out everything that we're doing in the faculty, but there's so much happening in the faculty of education, just proud of the people I work with. And I can't do what they do, and so I just have to stand back and say, wow, look what you're doing. Like, a lot of people don't know that we have an amazing chess initiative going on. Dr. Lance Grigg and Dr. Jeffrey McCormick are doing amazing work using chess to meet the needs of students, even in the area of corrections. Mm -hmm. And even a number of um, judges have shown this to be a promising type of way to get young offenders or people who are at risk of offending into chess uh, as, a, as a way to st start the process of helping these kids realize, wow, I'm smarter than I thought I was. Mm. You know, and they use chess in a restorative way, you know, restorative justice, and they use chess. Now, I, I won't explain too much about that. I mean, you can always, you know, our listeners can always contact Dr. Lance Grigg or Dr. Jeffrey McCormick to ask about it. But that leads into something else that's happening, and that is that there's a number of researchers looking at play. You know, the complex nature of play. We just, we're just starting to peel back the potential of play in children's lives. And I'm not just talking about young children. I'm talking about young adults and older children, too. And looking at the, the effects that play can have on the human brain and how kids seem to learn accidentally through play. Well, they're not learning accidentally. The brain is wired to play and to discover and to grow and, and to to grow the number of synapses that are connecting neurons in the brain, play seems to do that just kind of naturally. Right. And so there's research in our faculty going on as to the effects of play on learning. So I know that you have said that uh, great diversity and variability is, is the norm. That's right. Uh, and that this is an important sort of cornerstone of pedagogy for you. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you might explain what that means. And sure. Martha Nussbaum once said that human beings have a great difficulty about being human. And I think it's because uh, we, have, we have difficulty wrestling with variability in all of our uh, abilities and inabilities and personality differences and all that. But the truth of the matter is that great variability in human nature is actually the norm of human nature. And instead of saying, okay, well, here's the average, and you fit under the bell curve, this is where you are, and these guys are exceptional. The truth of the matter is, is that we all are exceptional. We're all diverse. And so we, we should embrace it. We should embrace and not think in terms of, hey, I'm doing you a favor to include you. We should be thinking in terms of, of course we're including you because you're part of human beings. You're, 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 you're part of what we are as a human being. So if you're a person with Down syndrome, guess what? You're a person with Down syndrome. And if you're a person with an uh, anxiety disorder or ADHD, guess what? Yeah, so what? That's the beauty of you. You know, that's who you are. That makes up who you are. It's like we got to start looking at human nature like a carpet. You know, you see the back of the carpet. It looks all messy because all the threads are in there. But you turn it over and you see this beautiful pattern. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that we're a beautiful pattern because we are all diverse and, you know, complex and interwoven. And, and we don't look, we're not perfect. And uh, one, of the, one of the books that I like, to, and I even thought of using this as a textbook, The End of Average by Todd Rose. And I thought of using it as a textbook in my Ed Sight class and in my Exceptionalities class. One of the things Todd Rose talks about is this great variability of what makes up the human condition. But he says, you know, we have been convinced over time to think in terms of human beings fitting somewhere on this spectrum of average or not average. And he says it's, that's, it's a myth to look at what's average and what's not average. You know, this is, I teach to the average, or I teach in the middle. Well, all that's really a myth. He demonstrated that perfectly a few years ago when he was looking at some research that the United States Air Force did when they were looking at what is average. And they had designed their cockpits to be the average. So they, they tested 4,000 pilots. They looked at the length of their fingers, the, their length of their arms, their shoulder width, their hip width, their length of their legs. And they took all the 4,000 dimensions and they put them into an average. And that's what they then took to design the cockpits. But unfortunately, those pilots were never quite fitting the cockpit properly. 
And so another researcher took those 4,000 files and then they took the average and they would pull out individuals and they say, okay, how many of these individuals actually fit the average perfectly? And they were stunned to find out that out of the 4,000 people that made up the average, zero actually fit the average. So when you design a program for the average, you're actually designing it for nobody because nobody actually fits the average. So what you need to do is you need to think in terms of, okay, we need to design for variability. We need, to, we need to design a program for a diverse learner. We need to allow ourselves to differentiate in all different directions and really teach to the margins. If you want to get most of the people, you teach to the margins. You don't teach to an average. And so that faulty way of thinking, uh, we put out in the forefront of our thinking and say, all right, you need to teach all students. That's just your job as teachers. So how do you teach this great complex variability that we call the human being? That's my job is to teach them how to do it. And um, again, it just starts with accepting the fact that we are variable. Very powerful. Yeah, it is powerful. It. Yeah. Wish I could claim it as my own. It's not. <laughs> but it's very powerful. Yes, but it's a really important foundational principle for um, pedagogy, whether you're teaching teachers to be teachers or your own teaching practice. That's right. So, exactly right. Yeah. Well, this has been really fascinating, oh, a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your philosophies thank you. Uh, with us. Yeah, thank you.